I love math. <laughs> but I didn't always like math class because I was finding myself doing the same thing over and over and over again. In fact, one time in eighth grade, I was so bored of doing my homework that I wrote a calculator program to do the homework for me. <laughs> now I'm a computer science student at UT Dallas. I still love math, and I love programming, and I love using one to further the other. But that's why it makes me so upset when I see a math education system that fails to inspire. Because we're teaching math as if it's not a creative pursuit. Imagine if we taught art the same way we teach math. You go to school, and all of your assignments look like this. You fill in the uh, region with the color associated with a number, and then you turn it in and get a new one. You don't get to draw the lines, and you don't get to choose your own colors, and that's the creative aspect of math, or the creative aspect of art, rather. And that's, no one would teach an art class this way. But this is exactly how we're teaching math. Because most of the assignments look something like this also cookie cutter, except instead of having six problems, you have 60. There are the exact same types of problems, but the numbers change, the letters change, but other than that, it's the same thing. It's the same color by number over and over and over again. It's very easy how someone can get bored with this. The problem is that in order to sate the demons of standardized testing, teachers have had to resort to teaching types of problems. They teach the template of the problem, template of the solution, and it's the student's job to just memorize these pairs of templates for, and solutions for problems. And then the test, they just identify the template, regurgitate the solution. It's all templates and solutions. And there's no original thinking involved. It's become a memorization game. And this is a problem because teachers cannot accurately predict every type of problem a student is going to see in their future. So knowing how to solve types of problems you've never seen before is a really valuable skill, and that's valuable outside the math classroom. Everybody needs to know how to think outside the box, and where better to learn it than a subject that's about thinking outside the box? Math. Here's a checkerboard. It's eight by eight. There are each domino takes up two checkerboard squares. You can put them vertically or horizontally. Um, and this checkerboard can be tiled with dominoes without having any overlap or over ha dominoes hanging off the edge, such that every square is filled with a domino. Let's say I take my magic scissors. All right, you ready? I cut off that square and that square. Can this figure also be tiled without having any dominoes hang off the edge? It's a pretty tough question. But in cases like this, a teacher can ask leading questions to help a student arrive at the answer. If they just answer, take all of the answers to the smaller leading questions and put them together. For example, I could ask, how many squares are there? How many are red and how many are black? And in the original photo, six by six, or sorry, eight by eight. So that's eight times eight, 64 squares, half, so half, of, half were red and half were black. So half of 64 is 32. All right, 32 red squares, 32 black squares, but that was before I cut two off. So now there are 30 red squares and 32 black squares. Next question, can I place a domino such that it covers two black squares? I don't think so. I think every domino, no matter how I place it, has to cover one red square and one black square, or one black square and one red square. Going back to the bigger question, if I've got 30 red squares and 32 black squares, and each domino takes one of each, I'm going to be left over with two black squares at the end, no matter how you do it. So there are going to be some gaps in the solution. So therefore, it cannot be tiled. And most students, when they get this problem, will say, does this, do I remember this one from class? Any of my classes? No. <laughs> then I give up. I don't know how to solve it. Instead of taking the answers, taking the things they do know, and using them to find the thing that they don't know. Now, this art of asking leading questions to try and explain a different question. I mean, explaining a question with more questions sound, sounds confusing. But in some cases, it, it can lead the student to the answer. It's not new math. 
It's called the Socratic method of questioning. And let's just say it's been around a little while. The thing about the Socratic method is that it's a really good way of explaining things to people. And that's the next element that's missing, is explaining. And I don't mean teachers explaining things to students. It happens all the time. I'm talking about students explaining things to other students, especially when the other students don't already understand what's being explained. This is a really valuable skill outside the math classroom because no matter what job you have, you're going to have to, whether it's business or sales, you're going to have to explain your ideas to other people. I mean, a history essay is just someone explaining their ideas to someone who doesn't already agree with them. That skill goes everywhere. And instead of learning it in a subject that's about explaining things to other people, math, we're just not learning it at all. Explaining is an art because there's no one best way to explain something. There's rarely one best way to explain something, but some ways are better than others. So finding which ways are better is pretty challenging, and it just takes a lot of practice to do. And we're not giving students practice explaining things because it doesn't fit on a multiple choice exam. And being able to explain something in your own words is indicates a much higher level of understanding. In Bloom's taxonomy of knowledge, that's a much higher level of understanding, being able to explain the answer rather than just compute the answer. But when we're testing our students for knowledge, we only ask for the latter. Let's go to an example. So when I was in middle school, I would argue with my friends about anything after class. And on this day, we were debating the biggest conundrum we could find is 0.9 repeating equal to 1. Most people thought that it was a little bit less than 1. Some people thought it was approximately equal to 1. But once one of my friends said, no, it's equal to 1. Equal to 1. We asked him to explain why he thought that was the case. And he gave this explanation. He started by saying something that we all agreed with. One third is 0.3 repeating. Then he said, OK, multiply by 3. The left-hand side becomes 3 thirds. In the right-hand side, each 3 becomes a 9, 0.999 repeating. Now, 3 thirds is another name for 1. In 30 seconds, he had explained his argument, and we were all convinced. Because these are exact equalities. These are not approximations. 0.9 repeating is just another name for the quantity 1. The same way two minus, 3 minus 2 is another name for the quantity 1. The best part about this example is that the student used logical reasoning to connect each step to the next. Each step is well explained why it has to follow. And, that's the, and then another thing that's missing from a math education is logic. You see, because in science class, well, since science is about using reproducible experiments to find facts about the world, in science class, you learn the facts, but you also learn the experiments which verify those facts. You probably remember learning about experiments in middle school and high school, maybe even doing some experiments in middle school or high school science class. Now, math is about using logical arguments to find facts about the world. And we learn the facts. We learn the facts all day long, but you don't learn the logic behind why they must be true. If you ask a student, why is the quadratic equation true? They'll probably tell you, because my teacher told me so. Or because it's written in my textbook. Somebody else is smart and they think it's true. It must be true. That's not acceptable, because we need students to be able to critically evaluate arguments. I mean, they'll have to do that in their future anyway. When they get to political arguments, they have to take the speaker and take their logic and say, I follow this, I follow this, but you made a mistake there. Something like that. We want students to be able to critically evaluate logic, to be able to raise their hand and say, teacher, I don't believe you. Why is that true? But we're not giving them the opportunity to do that. I don't think that fits into a multiple choice exam either. So here is another time in middle school. I'm talking with my friends. Someone has a proof that, or the claims to have a proof that 42 equals 1. And I don't believe that. But 
if you can't point out a flaw in the logic, you have to accept the conclusion that 42 equals 1. So we're like, OK, try me. So he starts by saying that x equals 0, let x equal 0. OK, sure. Now, 42 times 0 equals 0, but so does 1 times 0. So 42 equals 1. Great. Now he says, let me divide both sides by x. Sorry, he says 42x equals 1x. Then he says, let me divide both sides by x. And now he has 42 equals 1. <laughs> there must be a mistake somewhere, but where? Each step seems like it follows from the previous, but it doesn't quite. Because going from step 3 to step 4, we divided by x. And x is 0, so you can't, you can't divide by 0 because you can't divide something by nothing. That doesn't make sense. Like, what would, for, what would 42x divided by 0 even be? Right? That doesn't make sense. So there is a flaw in the logical argument. We want students to be able to identify these flaws because identifying this flaw is almost the same type of thinking it takes to identify flaws in other arguments, like political arguments. Take this argument. If we allow more interracial marriages, then marriages will become more common. If marriages become more common, then incestuous marriages will become more common. And we don't want that. Now, this is a real argument. <laughs> this is a real argument given in the Supreme Court of California in the majority decision in 1948 against or in favor of anti-miscegenation laws. You see, the author commits a slippery slope fallacy going from step one to step two to say if we allow this type of marriage, then more of these types of marriages will also happen. That's, that's a fallacy. But identifying that fallacy is the same type of thinking that it takes to identify the fallacy in the previous example that step four did not follow from step three in the previous example. Step two does not follow from step one. Now, we're not getting students to be able to recognize these flaws because they're just accepting what their teacher is giving them. In fact, I'm surprised students have any creativity or original thought after 12 years of being beaten over the head with the same mindless memorization games day in and day out. It's no wonder they hate the subject. It's a shame, because it's not a bad subject. In fact, I had some pretty good math classes. Um, <laughs> um, I was lucky to have some pretty good math classes. My math teachers did not just give us problems from the textbook. I mean, they had to give us some problems from the textbook so that we would be prepared for some standardized test somewhere in the future. But after that, we had challenge problems. And challenge problems were not problems that the teacher told us how to solve in class. He gave us all the tools to solve in class, but he didn't tell us how to solve them. Instead, that was our job, to go home, put these tools together using logical arguments, connect them with logic, and then find the solution, and then explain our solution to the challenge problem, as if the person we're explaining it to doesn't already know the solution. And that allowed me to not be bored in math class, because it, it gave some creativity in finding that best explanation. Or if you can't find the best one, try and find the best one, try and find one that's better than others. And these are changes that a lot of math teachers already want to make. We can do this, and if we do, society can be improved, but it starts with improved education. Now, this is all about empowering the connections that we have with each other. You may not be a teacher, but if you're a sibling of someone trying to learn math, or a cousin, or even a friend, and they ask you for help, I urge you, don't just explain what, but also why things are true. Because we need our next generation to not only be able to solve for x, but also for any variable that comes their way. Thank you. <laughs>